it's almost impossible to forecast which one is up. and just turn right and go up the stairs into the meeting room. Good morning. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. You're going to give us a hand? Yeah. Excellent. I've got a, an itinerary for everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Non. Je la couronne. Ah. Oui. Ah. Oui, oui. Je vais y aller. Non, je peux pas. Oh. Oh, tu sais, je peux te représenter ça. Ah, ouais, 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 ouais. Euh... Allez, bonjour. Je vous Oui, oui, Et 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Fender. Nice to see you all. Here. Uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. Uh, there's coffee, juice, uh, if you want something to eat uh, before we get going. Uh, we'll do that. We'll probably get started with the tours and everything in about uh, 10 minutes. So, uh, Sean, do you think we have it? Is, are all the buses here? Is this? Yeah, that's everyone's, everyone's here. Well, I think we're setting the, uh, the world record for the most visitors to, uh, to the factory in, in a day. So thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, get comfortable. Uh, if anybody wants to play any of the guitars, that's what they're uh, here for. We're not going to sell these to anybody. Okay, they're uh, they're up there for playing. So we get started in a few minutes. Thanks. guitars. Most days it was two guitars, three guitars, things like that. That was how guitar production in Corona started. Now this factory is 177,000 square feet. We have over 800 workers and our daily guitar production is 542 guitars every day. So some of the other things that you'll see as you go through here. In our woodworking area, out in the where we actually make all the necks and bodies, we make the necks for our production here in Corona, for Jackson, for Custom Shop, and the necks that come on the guitars made in Mexico. So our woodworking area make uh, right around 1,200 guitar necks and bass necks per day. So again, you'll see a lot of a lot of necks, a lot of wood bodies. We make all of our bodies here. The factory in Mexico, they uh, they make all of their own bodies for. For their guitars. You'll also see a lot of things where it's a joint effort between Mexico and Corona. The two factories work very, very close together as an example as we go through the amplifier area. Any of the circuit boards, the printed circuit boards that you see, those were actually produced in Mexico, sent to us. The cabinets, the wood cabinet, are made at the factory down in Mexico. But all of the metal work that goes into an amplifier, the actual metal chassis, is done here. Whether it's for uh, one of our Dynatech series amps or any of the other ones, that's all done here and then sent to Mexico. So you'll see necks from here getting ready to go to Mexico. A lot of things back and forth all the time. The, uh, the factory in Mexico is in a city called Ensenada. And Ensenada is about 200 miles uh, south of here. So it's actually pretty close. It's, it's not uh, not all that far. A lot of us go back and forth to the factory in uh, in Mexico all the time, where their guys will uh, will come up here. So, uh, again, I told you pictures are fine. Um, with this many people, we're going to break up into groups of about 15 people. Again, there's some of the areas in the factory where we are doing some. Uh, we're adding some new machines, especially in our uh, mill and woodworking area because our production is so high and frankly our business has been so fantastic thanks to everybody here uh, we've been buying a lot of new machines so we have some new equipment out there some of it's in place some of it's not so it's uh, walking through the area you'll see it's uh, a little bit more uh, disorganized than we would normally have uh, for a regular production but the last two or three months with buying a lot of this new machinery some of it uh, is just now uh, being installed so we'll, uh, we'll make sure everybody sees the, uh, the custom shop. We'll spend some time in there. Again, a lot of the, the great custom shop stuff you'll see at the show has already left and uh, is over at the convention center. But there'll still be some, uh, some nice things uh, over there. You'll see, uh, again, our amp production area where we're still making all of the uh, vintage reissue amplifiers. Things like the 59 Basement, the 57 Twin are all produced right here. A lot of the tube amplifiers again are done here. You'll see our metal shop where we actually make a lot of the parts that go into the guitars and the amplifiers. It's something that really sets Fender off from a lot of other companies. The fact that we make 
all of the Stratocaster bridges. We make all of the Telecaster bridges. Uh, we stamp all of the pick guards. We cut up all of our frets, things like that. Most guitar companies, even the big ones, even somebody like Gibson, things like that, they buy all of that from outside people. But the Fender tradition, literally going back to Leo Fender, Leo Fender loved the idea of making parts making little tiny metal parts so the whole thing fit together. A lot of the equipment you're, you're going to see, especially in our metal shop, comes from the CVS days of Fender. There's one, one machine out there Fender has owned since 1962. So there's a tremendous amount of heritage that you're going to see. Uh, again, we have some old workers, we have some old machines, but it all, uh, it all works very, very well. And I think you'll see uh, an amazing number of people actually working on the guitar. I think we counted at one point, there are somewhere between 60 and 70 different people that touch every guitar that go through. This is not a factory where we just stamp them out. They don't come out of a mold, they don't come out of a stamp. Machines don't make guitars, people make guitars. The machines help us do it a little bit faster. So I think you'd be very surprised at the amount of handwork that goes everything. All of the sanding, all of the buffing of every guitar is all done by hand. So uh, watch that as you go through. And you, I think you'd be surprised at the number of uh, people involved. Again, there's about 800 people working at this factory. Most of our departments that you'll see work uh, two shifts, 10 hours a day. So a lot of the, again, a lot of the machines that you'll see out there run uh, literally 20 hours per day. So the, uh, the demand for Fender product is uh, as good as it's ever been. I've been with Fender since 1980 and have never seen production on American-made product as high as it is right now. Our factory in Mexico is also at a record level. They're making almost 700 guitars per day. So the demand for all of the Fender product, everything from the, you know, the Chinese local cost product all the way up to things from the custom shop is, uh, is just amazing. <laughs> so uh, if I could get all of the, uh, the tour guides up here, I want to introduce you to everybody and uh, as we say, some very interesting characters. Okay, so I know we have a group of uh, uh, Spanish-speaking people. This is a uh, Senor David Brown. Hola. Hola. David is part of the uh, the quality control staff. He is uh, uh, one of my one of my guys, and uh, he is fluent in both English and Spanish. So David is going to be taking the Spanish speaking group. So if you want to get started with those people right now, again, as we go out through the factory, some of the groups may be bumping into each other. Uh, that's fine. Uh, if anybody gets lost, uh, just start yelling. Okay, that'll work. If you're lost for more than about an hour, we'll just bring you some sandpaper so you can start working. Okay, or maybe a, a, a file. It's a, don't worry, we'll, we'll put you to work if you get lost. Okay? If you have bags, anything like that, if you want to leave them in here, that's fine. This is a safe, oh yeah, right. The, in the back, there is a bin that has safety glasses. If you have regular glasses, that's fine. If not, grab a pair of uh, the plastic safety glasses. And if you lose those, they're uh, $25. Okay, so just so you remember. The tour is free. No, no charge for the tour. Okay, for the next group, I'm going to introduce Gina DiVincenzo, who is our uh, quality assurance uh, amplifier technician. Gina, Gina even goes back to the days when uh, Fender was building amplifiers up in Oregon. So, uh, tremendous amount of experience, especially with the electronic side of things. So, uh, yes, Gina is going to take uh, anybody under five feet tall, so they can all... No, that's, that's me. I didn't say that. <laughs> So if we could get another group of about 15 people. Yeah, okay, Patrick, yeah, a group of, no more than about 15, be, only because when we get in certain parts of the factory, it's real noisy, it's really hard to hear anybody talk if the groups get, uh, get too big. And I'll tell you right now, no, there are no free samples. Sorry, I mean, everybody asks, but uh, yeah. This is not like going to the bakery. 
Okay, next is Nick Tonti, who's one of our manufacturing engineers. Nick's fairly new with us, but doing a tremendous job out uh, helping the manufacturing people, uh, designing new processes and machines. So as soon as the uh, area clears there, you can grab your next batch. <laughs> Okay, this is Dave Maddox, and I told you about the, uh, the first five people that started the factory in Corona. Dave was one of those five people that came out and he used to wear many hats. Now he just wears one larger one. He's uh, in the quality assurance department. His uh, main area of responsibility is the customer shop. So, and I'll take all the leftovers. The uh, the office areas up here. The the people back here do all of our uh, purchasing, planning coordinating of all of the parts. Again, all of the things that we're making, all the different models, with over 500 guitars per day, about 100 amplifiers per day, Fender jacks and all that, the coordination of all of the raw materials, parts, things like that is amazing. Because the parts that we use, the lead time, or in terms of how long it takes for us to get a part once we order it, can be anywhere from two or three days to three months, depending on what it is. An example, ordering a uh, uh, a Jensen speaker from Italy, from the amps. Lead time with Jensen is about two to three months to get speakers from the time we give them an order. We've got also, on the other extreme, we have a local supplier, the guy who makes a lot of our uh, knobs, the strat knobs, the plastic pickup covers. We don't make those. Uh, they're injection molded. That guy's uh, shop is two blocks from here. We can get parts in two days. From him. So trying to coordinate all of that to make sure that every day we have enough parts in every department to make sure that it all matches up. Because lots of times we may have these necks and these bodies, but maybe we don't have one other thing. So they have a, a pretty, uh, pretty serious job of coordinating all of that. The area down here is our engineering area. Engineering meaning the guys who do um, help program all of the machines. They figure out all the manufacturing processes, but then they also do uh, the documentation because of, again, all of the different things that we make. We have to have real elaborate documents to show how many screws, how many nuts, how many bolts, plus how long does it take. We need to know how much a guitar costs at the end of that production line, what the, uh, what the parts are, what the labor is to go into it so we know how much money we're making so we can figure out how much to sell it for. So engineering and also the guitar R&D department. Uh, Fender has a, uh, I mean, total within the company between electronics and uh, guitars, we have over 60 people in our R&D departments. Uh, the larger department is electronics R&D, and they're in our corporate office in Arizona. The guitar R&D department is 16 people, which is pretty substantial. And one of the things that's made Fender so successful in the last couple of years is a lot of the new innovations that our guys have come up with. Things like the noiseless pickups, the new S1 switch, some of the, uh, the new hardware are all things that other guitar companies just don't have the people to try to do things like that. So as we go through the plan, I'll point out some of those things. Again, they're unique things you can only get on a Fender. Now, if you notice up here, the, uh, the doors, uh, all of that figured maple, that was a, uh, we traded uh, our uh, wood supplier, guitars for the doors. <laughs> so uh, uh, we actually had those doors, we, were, we had another building uh, here in Corona and when we moved out we took the doors with us. We said they were much too nice to leave for the, uh, the guy who was going to move in there for their 75th anniversary. And we were commissioned by uh, Disney to do that, and it was for a, a contest. Disney, it was, and it was only in the U.S., they had a, a Disney 75th anniversary music CD that they were selling. And in that CD was a, a scratcher, and this was one of the prizes. And with all of these contests, they have to tell you the odds 
of winning, but they also have to put a value on all the prizes. And Disney valued this at forty thousand dollars as a one of a kind, one unique Disney piece. But the thing that made it so valuable, not only was the was the whole Disney motif, but the fact that it says Fender on it. Disney worked with a lot of outside companies, but normally they don't let that outside company put their name on the product. It's a Disney product, but they knew this would not be worth forty thousand dollars if it said Disney. Yeah. If it was a Disney cast or a Goofy cast or whatever, but because it said Fender and it was an authentic Stratocaster, that's what made it valuable. Hello, Verna. So again, some more of our uh, our flame maple doors. We always know if you come into work one day and your door is missing, you just... <laughs> This is the final assembly department, and we'll walk through the factory and then come back and spend a little bit more time here, and it'll all make a little bit more sense. This is Again, the end where all of the things from all of the various departments uh, come together. So all of the guitars that are sitting in these racks are either ones that are uh, waiting to be checked by our inspection crew or are waiting actually to be uh, scanned into the system where we create the barcode label and actually it turns into an actual guitar right there instead of being just a collection of parts. Prior to this guy actually inputting into the system, it literally is just a collection of uh, nuts, bolts, keys, strings, plastic, and wood. Over 2,700 guitars per week. Yes. Yeah, again. So again, we want to make sure everybody in the factory knows what the company's goals are. That this is, you know, these numbers, how important it is. It's not, not just the guys up in the front office knowing about that. Everybody in here needs to know where they fit into creating that, that number. This is our U.S. amplifier production area. This, this department produces probably about oh, 15 to 20 percent of the amplifiers that we sell. The factory in Mexico probably make about 50 percent of what we sell and the rest comes from uh, an assortment of factories in Asia. So we're making all of the higher end tube amplifiers, all of the vintage amplifiers, all of the Pro Tube series. Uh, all of the custom amplifiers, a small number of the uh, high-end solid-state uh, base amplifiers are made here. We're also making all of the SWR Pro Series uh, amplifiers and enclosures. Uh, the ladies along here, she's working on one of the custom fiberbird amps, which is an actual point-to-point, hand-assembled amplifier. A lot of people talk about that idea of point-to-point -point wiring. Literally, every component on there is soldered in by hand. Compared to, this is another way we'll make an amplifier. This is a, um, um, a Fiberlux that has some hand wiring on it. So something like a Fiberlux, um, 
a 59 Baseman, a 65 Twin, a 65 Deluxe is made the same way, where we hand wire the tube sockets and the jacks, but the controls and the preamp components are actually mounted to a circuit board. Okay. So now this cir these circuit boards come to us from Mexico. They have all of the equipment down there to wave solder and assemble the circuit boards. But the metal chassis I was talking about, this is all made here. So this is kind of hybrid. Some of it's uh, hand wired, some of it's done on a circuit board. But amps like the Vibro King, uh, the Vibro Verb, the 57 Twin are all done like this, what you call point to point wiring. So this is how Fender amps were originally done. Really up until the, uh, the early 80s, all Fender amps were made this way. One of the differences, old Fender amps didn't have nearly as many components. Even an amp like this probably has oh, 30 or 40 percent more components in it than a, uh, say an original 65 Deluxe Reaver had it. With all the channel switching, high gain, things like that that we've added into some of these amplifiers, there's just a lot more, uh, a lot more components to go into this. Making USA Fender amplifiers, we have seven different versions of every amplifier depending on what part of the world you are. So, you might recognize this. Yes. <laughs> this is a, you know, this is an Australian unit. We have one guy in our R&D department out in Arizona on the electronic side of it, and he's our safety engineer. His entire job is making sure that all of these amplifiers meet the various safety standards. It doesn't matter if it's England, Germany, Australia, Japan. More and more now, countries are imposing stricter regulations on any kind of electronics coming into the country. For years, we had a generic export amp. Some of them even had just nothing on the end of the... Right. Others, the idea was, ah, if you don't like the plug, cut it off and put your own on. Mm. Right? We also had a switch on the back of them. You could run an amplifier anywhere from 100 volts to 260 volts. Yeah. Well, the problem is that's mostly been outlawed. You can't do that anymore. Units have to come into the country with a, uh, the right plug, the right voltage, no more switching because they know customers will probably screw it up somehow. So, because of it, again, there's seven different versions. So even though the amps, you know, only come in one color, we do have a lot of other things that we have to do, depending on where that uh, amp's going to go. You know, some of the other unique things, again, in the Fender amplifiers, things like the transformers. We work very close with all of the outside vendors. So this is a unique proprietary Fender part. No other company can call up the, our supplier and say, you know, those Fender amps really sound good. Can I have 10 or 12 of those uh, Princeton Reverb Transformers? Those, you know, again, we work very closely. A lot of these vendors are almost like an extension of our engineering department. Our engineers talk to their engineers to come up with, you know, these types of things. So, on, especially in a tube amp, the heart and soul of it is the transformer. You get that right. A lot of other things are going to uh, uh, be much, much easier. So these are all unique things. Again, we work real closely with uh, all of our suppliers. Again, this is one of the the panels that we would put into our. Uh, I think this is one out of a Vibro King. The the idea of point to point wiring, just like Leo Fender came up with. And Leo's original idea with doing it like this. Again, remember, Leo Fender was a repairman, so he was thinking it's going to break. When an engineer designs it, his, he assumes his design is perfect and it's never going to break. That's why, you know, you get something, you can't get it apart. Well, that engineer assumed, oh, there's never going to be anything wrong with it. Leo knew you were going to have to fix it, so this can be, all of these components can be pulled out right from the top. You know, if you have a printed circuit board, if you want to get a component out, you have to get to the bottom. All of this can be pulled out right from the top and a new one put in. That's kind of was Leo's philosophy behind all of that. Right there. 
when we purchased SWR, we uh, we took a look at their their product and realized how similar it was to what we do. I mean, a base amp is a base amp, frankly. Whether it says Ampeg or Fender or SWR, it's all really pretty similar. So we were able to um, incorporate all of the SWR uh, units into our factories. We took all of their Pro Series amplifiers, they're being done here. Their Working Man Series is being done at our factory in Mexico. And then their entry level product are being done now at a uh, factory we work with in Indonesia. And it's worked out really well. Absorbing them into our operation was, uh, was really pretty easy. We brought a fair number of SWR people uh, here because they were also in the uh, Los Angeles area. Wiring, there's five or six of them. They always do that when those come along because those ladies have been doing that job for years. We trained them when um, when we moved the fact the electronic factory down from Oregon. We picked those five or six ladies and said, "Okay, you are the team that are going to build these." Now those are limited production, so they don't necessarily build those every day. So you might see one of those ladies working on something else. But as soon as those come onto the production schedule, boom, they're back there doing that. They're really key workers. Uh, in terms of testing our product, we have a computer system that we use to check all of the electronics. Uh, when the amplifier is just in that raw form, what we call a chassis, that's run through a computer test. Then once it's all put together, the assembly people, they put in the cabinet, uh, speakers, reverb springs, we still go through and do an actual sound test on it to check all of those components. Uh, the cabinets themselves come up from Mexico, all, all done and ready to go. They have the vinyl, tweed, real cloth, all of that. Uh, here they're doing the packaging. So another thing is, you know, you've seen the effort that we go through to build an amplifier, but you all know, I mean, a twin reverb, that's a heavy amplifier. The last thing we want to have happen is go to all this effort and then it gets destroyed shipping it to you. So, you know, we spend a lot of time and effort working with outside people on all of the different kinds of packaging that's, that's available. So again, there's a lot of things that we have to become experts on that, frankly, we don't know anything about. I don't know anything about packaging and the strength of cardboard and all of this, but boy, you learn real fast when you get a call saying, hey, the last five twin reverbs that showed up at, uh, you know, Sam Ash Music in New York are all broken. Like, uh-oh. Why? Well, that's because the truck driver slowed down a little bit for the delivery. They're just probably tossing them out the back of the truck. So, you know, the amount of research we have to go into. And again, we have outside suppliers that we use because those guys are the experts. We bring in a guy, his whole life is stuff like this. You know, and they're more than happy to show us, you know, we use this kind of cardboard and all that, but it all, you know, ends up being the, uh, the whole package. So we spend a fair amount of money just in the total cost of the unit to make sure that it arrives to you in good condition. Uh, the area in here is our uh, parts warehouse. This is where we store all of our uh, raw materials, sub-assemblies, things like that. Anything from guitar cases to cabinets, speakers, nuts, bolts, tubes, all of that. Uh, I meant to mention vacuum tubes. Uh, majority of the vacuum tubes are coming from Russia. Right now we have a small number of tubes that we get uh, from China. Uh, Preamp tubes that we use in a couple of models because the marketing guys like the sound of the Chinese ones in some of the more uh, kind of rock and roll applications. The Chinese ones tend to be a, a little nastier sound for distortion. Uh, we're also using some US made uh, 6L6 uh, tubes in things like the Vibro King, the 57 Twin, the new 59 Basement, all use a, a new American made uh, 6L6. Now, we don't store any of the completed units, guitars or amps. We have a whole other building that's about the size of this one that's uh, like a mile from here. That's our warehouse and distribution center. So uh, once or twice a day, we have a truck that comes over that takes everything from here over there. These are all bodies getting ready to go to the factory down in Mexico. Now, because of the, the capacity the number of units that we're trying to build. There's a couple steps in the operation that 
we literally don't have enough manpower to do here. So one of the things that, these are going to be American-made guitars. We're going to send them to Mexico. They're going to do the undercoat. They're going to spray the polyester undercoat on it and then send them back up to us. We just physically don't have enough space in our paint booths to do all of that. So these will go down exactly like this. These are all sanded, ready to go. They'll put the undercoat on them and then come back here and our people will will do that. And it's one of the great things about having having that as, a, as an option for, for us to do that. They've got... Uh, different different rules, regulations, things like that. One of the areas we won't see today uh, is the actual paint department. We don't take people in there anymore, only because we had some problems with things like contamination, things like you know bits of dirt, lint, whatever, coming off your clothes, and inevitably, where does it end up? Oh, right about there. <laughs> right about there. Of course, you never get the black spot on the black guitar. You get the black spots on the white guitars. And you get the white spots on the black guitars. So, um, the last couple of months, we've, we've taken almost like a clean room approach to our, our paint department, and it's really cut down on some of the dumb little things. I mean, so all of a sudden, you walk in there, and somebody's like wearing a sweater, you know, for a couple of You know, and two days later, they're picking little bits of hair and things, or lint, out of the, uh, out of the paint. So, um, but the painting issue is one of the, the big things we have to worry about here, because of all of the uh, pollution laws and uh, things, especially here in Southern California. And uh, not, that the, not that the factory in Mexico go out of their way to, you know, the air, they just have different restrictions down there. So they have the ability to use a lot more paint per day than we do. So that's another reason why we send some of that stuff down there. And uh, by the time they come back and they're all sanded and ready to go, they look exactly like one that we just straight polyester on up here. Okay, if you don't have your mind, you need your safety glasses. So next area we're going to go into is our metal shop, fabrication department. A lot of the stuff you see in these racks here are the, is the raw material that we make things out of. Uh, things like the, uh, the perforated metal will make the, uh, the grill out of a uh, for a base cabinet. Some of this fiber here is that same fiber I showed you that had all of those components on it. Buy it in these big sheets like this and then cut it up into uh, little pieces like that. So there's raw brass. And these are uh, different, uh, different kinds of fiber. For, uh, different kinds of steel, brass. Uh, there'll be the plastic that we make uh, pick guards out of. The, the, uh, the plastic we make the pick guard out of comes in boxes like that, so it comes in big sheets. So we'll use the uh, shear here to chop it up into s smaller pieces that are a little bit easier to handle. And this is some of the machinery I was talking about. Our metal shop area looks like a metal shop would have looked uh, probably in about 1954. This was current technology in the 60s. Things like a punch press, that's what all those machines are called. Those are called the punch press. That was how people made metal parts back then. They didn't have all of the new, they didn't have lasers and water cutters and uh, you know, computer controlled machines to do all that. It was a lathe, it was a punch press, uh, drill press, things like that. So most of this machinery we got from CDS. A lot of it was you know, 10 cents on the dollar. And the second machine in there, number 140, the one that we owned since 1953. So back here is all the different, some of the tooling that goes into those machines to stamp the parts out. None of this is the original tooling, all the original stuff is long gone, but this has all been rebuilt to basically the same spec. So the parts are made now basically the same way they were 40, 50 years ago. So a lot of the new technology doesn't necessarily make our kinds of parts any more effective. Truss rods. We make all of our own truss rods. And again, part of because of the volume that we're making so many, a lot of this makes sense. Again, if we were making 40 guitars a day, this wouldn't make sense. We'd go find a little shop, you know, machine shop, and have this stuff done. The fact that we're making 12, 1300 necks per day, yeah, this makes a lot of sense to do it ourselves. Binding. 
because this is going to be binding to go on one of the uh, Gretz White Falcons mm -hmm. that the, the custom shop is making. So we actually use this machine, it's a, it's a saw blade, but it can cut this vinyl to about, oh, uh, half an inch wide. And still make a nice, clean, clean cut. So this is the, uh, some of the binding material. So all the binding we produce here in these boxes behind you, this is the, uh, the rubber that we make the amp handles out of. So it comes in these big boxes, we just chop it up and then put the little piece of uh, spring steel there in the middle. Uh, pick guards are all stamped on the uh, the punch, punch press. And again, the volume, the fact that we're making pick guards for Corona production, custom shop production, Mexico's production, and the uh, spa aftermarket, you know, we can run you know, several hundred jazz-based pit guards at a time. We stop, it takes them about, oh, half an hour to 45 minutes to switch over to do a different part. In this area, we have a little over 600 different parts that we make. So again, those start as just a raw piece of steel. And we'll run them through the punch press a couple different times. Once just to cut out the, uh, the basic shape of it. Run them through a second time to actually emboss the word fender on them. Then we'll take them out and have them uh, plated. We don't do any plating here. Gold plating, chrome plating, we do that on the outside. That's a nasty business that uh, we don't want to have anything to do with. We have enough problems with painting and all that. Plating is like, ooh, that's... Yeah, the, the devil came up with that, I think. <laughs> but when I say, you know, we have about 600 different parts that we make, here's something like a, um, this is the pick guard for a 72 Tele Custom. I mean, we might only make five or 600 of these a year. So again, what in this box, that's probably uh, two or three months worth just right there. Again, there's other things that we might make five or six hundred three times a week. Again, having our own operation to do it um, gives us that flexibility. If we want to make 200 a year, no problem. If we want to make, you know, 5,000 a day, that's great too. It gives us a, a lot of uh, options. The world is alive. for a Blues Junior. Now we'll buy it like this from an outside company. If we don't have the machine uh, big enough to actually punch all the holes in it. But what she's doing back here, this is a computer controlled uh, press brake. And what this does is all the bending. So all the operator does is tell it what model and it knows what sequence to put in all of the different bending. over here. Oh no, he's doing the airplane. But we use that same machine to make all of the pick guards. So when we stamp the pick guards and they come out, you see the edges are still square. What the ladies back here do is one by one, they actually put the bevel along the end. And it's actually faster. You can see, I mean, she does that in about 20 seconds can do that. We discovered years ago it's faster to do it this way than try to design a machine. Because you'd have to have somebody standing at the machine anyway. So here's what they look like when they're done. That's the bevel. And then they have to go back through and also by hand they'll countersink all the holes. So here we're making all of the uh, the bridges 
Kelly bridges, Strat bridges, base bridges. Here's the tremolo block out of a vintage Strat. So this is a solid hunk of steel. A lot of people are always saying, well, you know, gee, what's the difference, say, between like a Mexico, Mexico Classic Series Strat and a USA Vintage Strat? Well, the bridge is one of the things. On a USA Vintage Strat, this is the block, the tremolo block. The one that goes on that Mexico Classic Series, the bridge we buy from Taiwan, the block probably has a third of the mass that this has. It's not made out of steel, it's made out of a cast metal. Again, it's pretty lightweight. It's subtle, but it's one of the things that makes that guitar worth the money. Yeah, but I mean, if you walk by, pick one of these up. I mean, you can feel there's a fair amount of weight right there. That's, that's a good, substantial hunk of steel right there. And that's why some guys, you know, you can hear the difference in them. So we buy this block, block of steel like this, and then begin all of the drilling and milling processes on that. Over here they have bridge plates. Those are American series bridge plates. Those are the tremolo blocks that we put on the uh, deluxe series. guitars apart and looked at the back of the pick guard, you see this aluminum foil, the shield on it. Well, they actually have a template. They put this on before they actually punch it on the, uh, the punch press. That way, they get a really nice clean cut with all of the holes and all of that. You don't have somebody after the fact trying to put this on and trim it out with, a, with an exacto knife or a razor blade, something like that. It goes on and once they punch it, then boom, all the holes and everything are cut. Some really wonderful old technology. The machine that we use to actually stamp the serial numbers in. Again, that that's been around a while. A lot of the a lot of the neck plates are uh, are like this, are made out of brass. Some of the newer metal parts that we do are made out of brass. Brass is a little bit easier to work with than steel. A lot of the original uh, fender parts, the vintage parts, are steel. The steel is a little bit tougher and a little harder uh, on all the machinery and the equipment. The brass is a little bit softer. It's a little easier to punch. Also, when they go to plate it, they can polish the brass a little bit before they put the chrome on it. They, these parts end up looking a little bit nice. But yeah, that's how we... Uh, Champion, all the uh, the serial numbers, anything like that. Old technology is best. Yeah. 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 Here's the fret wire. So all of these spools here are our fret wire. The machine she's got back there is chopping it up into little pieces. So we'll see the wire when we go out into the uh, mill, woodworking area. That vendor uses a process for putting the, the frets in that's a little bit different than most companies since 99% of the necks that we make don't have binding on them. We use the idea of we cut the frets to a, a general size and put them in and they hang over the edge of the neck and then we trim off the excess. And one of the reasons we do it is because it's a lot faster. When you actually have a neck with binding on it, you have to cut frets to the exact length. So if we do, say, a Jackson guitar, when we were doing a Guild guitar, when they put the frets in, the worker has a bin, 21 or 22 exact frets. And this is number one, this is number two. And 
they have to go at exact locations because they're cut to a specific length. The fender method is you just cut them all oversized and then trim them off after uh, they've been installed. Uh, this wire comes to us from a, a supplier in Japan. We also use a little bit of Dunlap fret wire in some of our uh, signature series guitars. The, uh, the Stevie Ray Vaughan, the Malmsteen, uh, Roscoe Beck, all, uh, those guys specify Dunlap fret wire. These are the bridge sections from one of the deluxe series guitars. There were Stratter and Kelly. Even though they look like they're plated, this is actually polished stainless steel. That the bridge section that we put in an American series guitar is a stainless steel. And stainless steel is almost impossible to plate. The plating doesn't want to stick to it. So when we went to uh, come up with the deluxe guitars, we figured, how can we make that bridge look a little bit nicer? So now he takes those sections right there and polishes them. He's got a group of what is about 20 of them in there. So those are all polished by hand. So that's how they come out. So that's never going to tarnish. You're never going to have any plating or anything chip off it because it's actually polished metal. What do they do with the gold ones? Those ones they plate, but if you ever see the gold ones, they don't look quite as fine. I mean, they're a little on the rough side. That's yeah. why it's like the gold, the gold is better than uh, nickel or chrome. It does, but they still don't. They don't have quite the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other problem would be if we tried to polish it and then plate it, it would that would be that yeah. It comes right, off. right. We can take the ones that are a little bit rough, put the gold on them, and it'll and stick. And you get a good bond. Right, because it's a little bit porous. Okay. Yeah. Pickup winding and then guitar electronics. So we'll also go upstairs. We have another pickup area uh, in one of our upstairs work areas. Just doing all of the new noise pickups. Primarily, what they're working on down here are vintage style pickups. So all of the vintage pickups are made the exact same way we've made them for the last 50 years. Where it's Two pieces of fiber, and I'm sure you had black fiber when they came in. It's what that stuff looked like when it's actually punched out. One of the tools we have makes the top and bottom piece. There's a P base pickup. We insert the magnets, then these are coated with lacquer, and the lacquer kind of insulates the actual magnets and everything from the wire. And then they come back over here and we start the winding process. Now we're probably making light use of some of the things we still have the models that we're using either in budget or in the market. So I think we're not very much. And we're going to be able to do this in the next area right here. Now we're going to be able to do this in the next So all of the pickups are wound to the same specs that they used to. We've even got the uh, the pickup wire coated so it looks exactly like the wire did back in the 50s. Originally the wire was this dark color because it had an enamel coating on it. The wire has to have a coating on it so when it's laying on top of each other it doesn't short out. So 